He has fished eight Bassmaster Classics and nine Forest Wood Cups, and he just may be one of the most polarizing anglers in professional bass fishing. This week, Randy Blockett joins me on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all, friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. As always, you're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. This is the 138th edition of this particular show, and I thank you all, all our humpers that tune in each and every Wednesday. Hopefully, we're putting a little hump back in your hump day, and uh, I am thankful for all of you watching week after week. And... um I'll be honest, uh, usually I talk about a bunch of different stuff before we bring our guest in, but this one is a long one, so to steal a line from the great Pat McAfee, how you doing, keep it moving, Randy Blockett is our guest this week. Now, Randy Blockett, as I said in the opening, is one of the most polarizing anglers in pro fishing, especially on YouTube. I mean, he has a legion of followers. Um some people agree with what he says. Some people disagree with what he says. And I'm I'm one of those people. I mean, there's a lot about Randy Blockett that I, I really agree with and enjoy. And there's a lot of it that I, I just don't agree with. And uh, sometimes that makes for a really unique and fun podcast. And that is definitely what this week is. Because we talk about a bunch of topics. Namely, something that I'm, that I'm noticing and, and I find concerning. The fact that it has become negativity sells in the fishing world. On YouTube, if you can say something negative, it gets people there. And and that, to me, is concerning because none of us ever got into fishing because of negative. We got into fishing because it makes us feel good. It makes us feel grounded. It, it, it's not something we do. It's who we are. We've all had this conversation before. So without further ado... Let's talk once again back on the podcast, Randy Blockett. Um, thank you for doing this, Randy. Man, thanks for having me on, Dave. It's just like when you get to be on your show, it's sort of like with a celebrity getting to be on Joe Rogan or something. It's <laughs> like the Mercer podcast is without a doubt the place everybody wants to be. So much appreciated you guys uh, inviting me there. About the only thing me and Joe Rogan have in common is our hairline. And I do love <laughs> MMA. Other than that, um, but I thank you for the compliments. Um, well, I that, don't, I, you definitely have got the biggest podcast in fishing. I'm not aware of any other podcaster that's has grown like you have over the last couple of years. I mean, you're going to be at half a million subscribers before too much longer. It's definitely growing. And, um, but I mean, I just kind of, I mean, I think that argument is like, if you go to iCast, I mean, I, I remember one year going to iCast and walking past every booth and you see people pitching when people used to pitch a lot more at iCast. You don't seem to see, see as much of that. But I remember walking down the hallway and literally by the time I got to the end of the hallway, I'd heard four different shows tell the person they were talking to that they're a number one rated show. So, <laughs> I, but I, I don't, um, th I'm thankful for, for everybody that tunes in and, um, and, and I'm especially thankful for the people that have been willing to uh, come on the show and, and really be open and honest because um, there's a lot of great podcasts in fishing. And um, I, don't, I don't know why they choose to tune into this one, but I, I'm thankful for it. Yeah, it's just like anything with, with the social media. I think people gravitate to personalities. You can't, that's something that people either have or they don't. You can't like fake or to create it. So everybody sort of got that unique to themselves on the, the podcast. Yeah, yeah, and and there's a new one coming every single day, Randy. You might yep. be the only one that doesn't actually have a weekly podcast that's in the YouTube game. They are. It's like I can't believe it's like everybody has a dang podcast now. You know, it's just getting harder and harder to stand out in that in that area there. Yeah, but I, I think whenever you look at it like that, it's also has to do with the. I think the coolest thing about podcasts is there is no rules. There's no limits. There's no. Joe Rogan's a prime example. I mean, you know how many people told him at the beginning of his podcast, it's way too long. Nobody will ever listen to it. But what the magic of his podcast is that you actually have real conversations. It's yeah. not like 
in the 1970s when people go on the Tonight Show. I mean, they practice the questions. I mean, they still do today. They're, they'll be like, okay, you got a you got a great story about going to the zoo. So at some point, I'll be like, so you've been anywhere lately, Randy? And you say, funny, you should ask. We went to the zoo. It. Uh, I think today's consumer, and I think your channel is a prime example of that, because there's a lot of people that that go to your channel, and quite frequently you'll hear people say things like, you're a voice for them in a world where they don't think that their voice is heard um, and different. But I think that's the cool thing. Now you don't, it's not just a, everything can, you can take it in whatever direction you want. And I think that um, I think more podcasts out there just shows how successful the media is. Well, the cool thing about the bass fishing industry, you know, I've been in it since 1985 fishing bass it's like I felt for so many years there we were under we were we were under this microscope that we could not be you couldn't be yourself you had to tell the yeah. line about this you know everybody had this picture of what a professional bass angler should be and how they should look and how they should act and I think people they detected some insincerity in that and now over the past five years specifically with YouTube and all the stuff we do you can see that people like. To, they, they like authenticity, even if they're rough around the edges and even if they say something that irritates people or makes them mad, they appreciate being real. And I and I think that's a good thing for, for the sport, for sure. Well, and I think me and you, our relationship and the, I mean, I think this is a third or fourth show we've done together. It's prime example of one of the things that's missing in the world is you got a bunch of people who if you disagree with what I feel on this you're gone. You're, you know what I mean? You're in the gallows. We're not, and me and you haven't always agreed. And, and I'm pretty sure we won't always agree. Mm -hmm. Um, but just because somebody has a different opinion, I mean, to me, the thing that gets lost in all of that is the fact that we all love the sport of fishing. Yeah. I mean, we're lucky to have that connection. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You're definitely, you're, you're definitely not here if you don't love the sport. And you know, like I said, it's you either have it or you don't. And, you know, people that are opinionated in a sport are passionate about it. And I respect that. I mean, there's a bunch of people that I do not agree with at all, but I respect the fact they put themselves out there because they have that camaraderie and that bond. And I, I fish, you know, I, I do a lot of those on the water lessons. So I've got to, yeah. I get to fish with people from all different viewpoints and worldviews and backgrounds. And it's like when you get them in the boat and you get away from all that external stuff, everybody's pretty much the same. There's not there's not a lot of difference in that. That is you know, definitely you, you tend truth. to like to create more drama than really exists out there. Yeah, there there is a lot of drama, a lot of drama from your channel, too, if I'm being totally honest. I mean, to be honest, oh, yeah. before I before we connect, I talked to my wife and I'm like, I said, I've got to shoot a show with Randy and, uh, and we've been working on doing this show for a little over a month. We've been trying to figure out a date that works for us both. Um, and this was one show I went into that I'm like, I, I don't know what I generally don't know what I want to talk. I just want to have a conversation with people. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't want to have an argument with you this whole time, but I feel like there's stuff we'll argue about because your well, channel, okay. in my opinion, is getting increasingly more negative. Yeah, I've heard that from some people, yeah. It, and Why do you think you're hearing that? Well, I think that a lot of people, they confuse negativity with trying to affect change for the positive. And obviously a lot of my, a lot of the emotions that are generated on my channel, either people that are for me or for against me have to do with my position on technology and live scope and forward facing sonar. I don't want to be labeled as like, that's the only thing I do. I have stepped into that arena and I have taken on that fight because I, I just believe it's bad for the sport in the long term, And there, for so many different reasons. And when you have a strong opinion on something like that, you're going to have some polarization there. And fr from the best guests that I can see out there from my own channel, you know, the demographic I have, I got 80% of the people that are completely agree with me and 20% of the people think that I just am the worst thing that ever happened to fishing and they just can't stand it, you know? So um, that's, that's sort of the nature of when you have a strong opinion on something. But like I said, I, the more that 
I get into this whole forward facing sonar deal, the more I got my heels dug into it because uh, I just think a lot of people see what they want to see in that particular topic. Uh, Do you, I mean, and, and I didn't, wasn't even, I mean, forward facing sonar is an obsession of yours. Clearly. I mean, uh, it came, you, you made a congratulations video for Larry Nixon and, and a different one for day David Fritz who was to congratulate these great hall of fame anglers people. But at some point it had to go, it never stayed there. It, it had to head off into, well, the reason they're leaving. And they both clearly did not say that was the reason they're leaving. They both said medical reasons. I mean, mm -hmm. and let's be honest, they're getting older, Yeah. <laughs> but do you not think you obsess over it a little much? Well, the more that I see it, the, one of the things about it, I have a lot of contact. I have a lot of friends in the industry mm -hmm. that fish both the Bass Pro Tour and the Bassmaster Elite Series. So I, I get a feel for what's going on that's a lot of people don't want to talk about. And from that standpoint, when I talk, when I, when I try to go into a different direction, once I started one direction, the point of the fact is that um, I've come to realize that all of the decades and all of the work that's taken guys like Larry Nixon and Clun and all the veterans out there to accumulate, pretty much they that that information and that decades of experience is not worth anything anymore. In, in, to, in the way that the sport is morphing, the technology, the way it's morphing, you can look at it from the standings. You can look at it from who's doing well in the tournaments. So from a traditional standpoint, um, that all that stuff is just not, there's no value to it anymore. And I think that is a tragedy. I don't think that's a good direction for the sport to go in. And another thing that I talk about is that, you know, we're talking about forward facing sonar in the state that exists right now, but they are working 24 seven with R and D to try to advance it even more. I mean, at what, at what point is it going to evolve to the point where it's just, everybody says, Hey, I think we've crossed a precipice here. This is a little bit too much. So I'm sort of looking down the, the road for a little bit in the future there. And um, I, a lot, a lot of what I talk about is a reflection of what my subscribers and my viewers feel, you know, and, you, and a lot of people on my channel, they just hear the people that call me a nut job and an idiot and a dinosaur and a, you know, get up, you know, hang it up, grandpa. I've heard, I hear it all out there, but you know, I've got a lot more people that are on my side with this and are against it for sure. On your channel, though. On my channel, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you, you. Well, but here's one. Well, I'm sorry, sorry go, go ahead. Well, not just on that because I had. It's just like I, I've gotten to the point now. My channel's gotten large enough where if if me and my family go on a trip somewhere. I'll get pulled over. Somebody will ask, somebody will stop me. Like we were on, we were in Colorado at my, at Owen's weightlifting competition this summer. And I had two people stop me in Colorado saying they watch the channel. Hey, Randy, watch the channel, man. I totally agree with your forward facing sonar stance. Well, that's what they always say. So I get it from a lot of different directions. People that I fish with, co-anglers that I fish with. It's not just my subscribers on my channel. I, I get it. I, I get reinforced the message that I'm putting out there a lot. And, and that, I mean, and, and that is very satisfying to know that there's a large group of people out there that share the way that I feel. And I can assure you, Dave, there's more people, there are more bass pros out there that lean towards that direction. What I'm talking about, they don't want forward facing sonar. They don't have to jack with it. They want to pick up a jig and go flip bushes or throw a chatterbait or buzz bait. They don't want to have to weenie worm around out there looking at a live scope, but they, they're just scared to say anything about it. I mean, that's, I really believe that's the, tr that's the truth. Do you really think they're scared? Cause, cause scared I'll be, I can only talk of the facts that I've experienced. I but think a lot I've of never had a sponsor and I'm sponsored by an electronics company. I've never had bass. I've never had anybody ever tell me you shouldn't speak in. And, and this past year on live, we talked about it. I mean, during Bass Live, I opened a segment with Davey Height when we were on Lake Champlain and I literally said exactly these words. Davey Height, we have anglers catching fish that they don't even feel eat. Is this what bass fishing is in 2023? And we had a 20 minute conversation of our feelings, the goods, the bads, the negatives, the positives. And not one person from Bass said anything. So this whole 
believe and I get it. It's a great narrative to push. You know what I mean? Like the, the big bass, they'll they'll silence you or I, I don't think that that exists. So, so you don't you don't think that the anglers out there that are sponsored or have partnerships with the electronic companies, you don't think they've had a gag order put on them to say, I don't want to hear anything bad about forward facing sonar. You don't think that's a reality? Why haven't they put it on me? What do you, well, I, I work with electronics companies. I work with Bass. If that was really a narrative that was being pushed, why haven't they said it to well, me? I'll just put it this way. I do know some pros personally that have partnerships with them that were told that. So that's, I'm not going to mention any names, but I do know, know that for a fact. Another thing, I think there's a lot of pros out there that just don't want to rock the boat with the sponsors they have. They don't want to, they don't want to be controversial. They don't want to, you know, stand out in any way. So, but I'm not really talking about, you know, the, you know, the pros as much as I am just like the, the average everyday dude out there, you know? Okay. So, so you, so you're just saying the average everyday dude does not want it. And, and, and that may be true. I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I think well, that from my right? experience, I mean, the interaction that I have, and that's the only thing that I have to go by. I mean, yeah. I get, I get the other side of the coin, you know, three people that comment on my channel, but the only I mean, I mean, the only feedback that I get, I mean, I just, I'm just going by what the majority of the feedback says. And it, it doesn't really matter to me what that feedback is. This is a position that I have. I mean, I, I have ever since I was in fourth grade in Duquesne elementary school, I've been reading Bassmaster magazine. All I wanted to do was to be a bass pro. That was it. I mean, I sacrificed everything. I'd never went to prom. I never went to dance. I never had a girlfriend until I was 23 you know, I mowed grass to pay entry fees. I, I and I was able to do it. I mean, I love the sport. I I love Bassmaster. I I get down on Bassmaster a lot. I'm critical of them, but that doesn't mean I doesn't I don't love the sport. I'm just trying to do it to affect positive change from my point of view, from my perspective. And I don't have any other agenda than the sustainability of the sport. I've I've had my day in the sun. I've won my tournaments. I've made my classics. My my career is in the twilight. That's not what's important. I am at the point where it's what can I leave for the future? I mean, that's my focus here. And a lot of people don't really understand that. And they say, oh, Randy just does this forward facing sonar stuff or clicks. It's not that. I lose subscribers all the time when I voice my opinion on, on, on anything like that. I, I did a, I did a uh, video uh, last fall on the on Lake Mead as far as the water levels dropping there and I was talking about what the state was saying about you know climate change mitigation issues and that type of stuff I lost 500 subscribers in one day just by mentioning the word climate change and anytime I do something like that with environmental issues or live scope I take a hit for it but it's a hit I'm, I'm willing to take so when people say that I'm just doing that to draw attention to my channel or whatever. I'm not, I've got a platform. I've got a large platform and it's important to me. It really is. I get that. So let me ask you this. You, I would say it's your point in your career. You're an educator. You, you and Johnny Schultz and everything that you guys do. And you educate a lot of people, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you not see the benefits that come from forward facing sonar, like in in that way, because because again, I've never once said whether I'm for it or against it. It literally all depends on the situation. I, I'm I am I think it's an incredible tool that people have learned a lot from. But I get I actually buy into your whole mystical feeling of you you shouldn't know like and and if you don't believe that, I mean, catch a fish off a bed and then catch a fish just randomly throwing a crankbait. There's a more excitement that comes from that because you don't know. So I, I buy into a lot of what you say. And, and as a commentator for bass, there's part of me that, you know, it's a lot easier when guys are catching eight pounders on frogs for, for me to commentate on it and make it a fun product. But I also feel as an angler and Rick Clun said it, anything that gives us any more education should never be stopped. Do you, how can you, now that the genie's out of the bottle, how can you turn your back on what we're learning? Because I don't agree with that. That's one thing. I mean, I've got a lot of respect for Rick. He's been a good friend of mine forever, but I don't agree with him on that. 
we don't need to know everything, Dave. We don't want to know everything. We have got to have an element of unknown in the sport. When you remove that unknown out of there, I've talked about this before, you take away so much of the intrinsic value of the sport of fishing. It's like when we, if I, say if I go down to Tabor Rock Lake tomorrow and I'm coming up on a main lake point to throw a jerk bait on, I don't want to know what's on that point. I, I want to have the anticipation that I'm going to fish that point and I'm going to work around it and I may or may not catch a fish on it. I don't want to, you know, grab that point or, or you know, live scope it and know if there's a fish there or not and move on if there's not. And I try, that's one thing I convey to everybody that I fish with that's in the boat with me and everybody can comprehend and grasp that. And I don't, that's this, that is the most fundamental basic premise of sport fishing out there is that sense of the wonderment and an unknown and not you don't know what's around that next corner we do not need to know everything out there bass fishing let me ask you this here if we if bass if the bass elite series circuit next year just had a deal okay guys we've made a decision we're just going to let 2d sonar is going to be the benchmark we're not going to allow anything over 2d sonar technology what is wrong with that? What t Tell me what is a negative in that term of just having 2D sonar and then everybody else using every other aspect of their being and their senses and their intuition and their instincts to locate fish. There's so much more value to that than what we've morphed into. I mean, we've literally morphed into a generation of anglers that cannot catch fish without technology. They simply do not have any skills to do it. I mean, is that what, is that the direction we want to be headed in? I, I just, I don't agree with that at all. I don't know that they can't catch fish without it. I mean, cause they do. I mean, we've had events where it isn't, I mean, it is a, trust me, I agree with you in the fact that it is dominating our sport right now, but I believe in educated decisions. I believe in, I believe in what Bass is doing this year. And, and you made a video about that saying, oh, they're just tossing us off. The Bass ignored what, what the what the public wants but those aren't facts like i would rather make a decision one of the things that gets compared to all the time on your channel is forward-facing sonar is a lot like the alabama rig and people will say if you can't throw an alabama rig how in the world can this be legal well i think that everybody can agree that the alabama rig was banned way prematurely like if we had to let it play out and we had to done some research, it may still have got banned. Maybe it wouldn't have got banned, but that was banned on public opinion, on people saying this is wrong. We can't have this in our sport. Now, Bass is making a step to try and study this and see truly how it's affecting the sport, not just people's opinions, but actual facts, scientific facts. Is that not is that as an angler, as an outdoor person, do you not want every decision made through science? Well, through real do, tangible you numbers? The, do you remember reading the bass press release on the alabama rig they said one of the reasons they banned it is in keeping with the tradition of the sport of bass fishing they did not feel that you know using a lure with five hooks is within the tradition of bass fishing and that's the same way i equate to live scope and the fact that i don't believe that if you can see a fish in real time and you can adjust your lures and your presentations based upon what you're seeing on a video screen to get that fish to generate the strike, I don't think that lies within the tradition of the sport out there. I think that's pretty easy for a lot of people to understand. And um, it's at, the, at some point, we just have to ask ourselves, and I posed this question before, at what point is, is it too much? I mean, at what point do we get where we're just, it, it's, it's crossed the line. I mean, do we, I think we talked about this on the last one, but I mean, do you see any point on that? I do. I do. I, I, I can see a world where it gets limited. I, 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 that's my, that's from the start. I've been like, there's going to be some kind of limit put on it. I, I think just because that being said, like Choya Fujita, the big name that gets thrown around, I mean, made five top tens last year out of nine events. Incredible. His first year on tour. Hmm. I think he makes just as many if he has won unit on his boat i mean he knows how to use it i'm sure there's an advantage to using five of them it would just confuse me but i i think that it will get limited at some point but i think that most people can agree that the banning of the alabama rig was premature it wasn't going to win every single tournament there is a bad conservation look 
to it. You're, I mean, you're lifting fish that are hooked in many different orifices and it doesn't. So I agree with that end of it, but I think it it's, it's new, it's brand new. And I think the thing about fishing that is so beautiful at the, at the base of it is the fact that you can do it whatever way you want. You can fish from shore and tie a bell on the end of your rod and fall asleep and wait for that bell to wake you up. You can do it as technical as possible. That's what makes the sport different for everybody. Well, yeah, I agree with that. But I mean, it's, I come at it from a, I come, I come at this whole technology thing from a lot of different perspectives, you know, from the sustainability, from, we talked about the mystery and magic, talk about the financial discrimination of the sport, talking about losing the tradition of the sport, talking about putting less value in actual, you know, bass fishing skills and knowledge of seasonal patterns and bass movement, and bass behavior. So there's a, there is a, and even the video I did yesterday on the, what the guys were telling me about the tackles, the little mom and pop tackle shops closing down because of it. But um, it, like I said, it, it depends on what your position is on the entire, you know, future of the sport. And if you're a tournament angler or if you're not, but one thing that you can't deny, look at the qualifiers from the Bassmaster Opens this year that qualified for the elites. Every single one of them dominated by forward facing sonar. If those anglers out there were limited to 2D sonar last year, I I I am confident to say you wouldn't have seen one of those names in the top 10 out there. And that to me is what's sad about it because you're rewarding you're you're rewarding things that don't have anything to do with traditional bass fishing standards you know things that we grew up with things that you know everybody learned to love about the sport things that made the sport that made you feel alive in the sport and you know one of the biggest justifications i have with this is my title sponsor bridgeford foods i mean they are totally on board with me they totally agree with you know my viewpoint on this whole thing so it gives me a lot of of confidence to move forward with it in that. And again, I never said I disagreed. I, I honestly feel that it, like it, most things in life, everybody's got to make their own decision. I mean, you take a room full of anglers and ask them what the best crankbait is, and you're going to get everybody with a different opinion. I think everybody has a different opinion on this end of things. I, I think it's insulting to today's anglers to say, that not one of those nine would have made the elite series without forward facing sonar. I mean, I, you can't, you can't disrespect the sport that you love that much. It's, it's speculation, but if you, if you look at those tournaments and you, and you study the anglers and what got them there to that point and their viewpoint on it, I think it's, I, I don't think that's a stretch to say that if you, if you talked about, you know, 200 and something anglers in a, in an open field, and you talk about some anglers that are more adept at traditional bass fishing techniques and, and other anglers out there that every single tournament they go to, they drop that live scope in and they don't consider any other option in their fishing. It doesn't matter if the fish are bedding, they're going to try to live scope them. If the fish are in a grass bed, they're going to try to live scope them. If you take that crutch away from them, then you have a completely different caliber of anglers emerging there. And that, and I'm all about work ethic. I'm all, I'm all about putting in your dirt time and paying your dues and, 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 and seeing justice. I want to see the people that work the hardest and put the most effort into it, you know, be successful with it. That's just the way that I feel about it. And I just, I see these hammers out there that have dominated the sport for so many years with traditional bass fishing techniques that simply cannot compete anymore. They're at the bottom of the standings every second freaking tournament, you know, simply because they they don't want to, they can't do it, they don't want to learn the technology, you know, they they they've got they've been successful for so many years with things that's worked for them that's that are worthless now. And I'll go back to the same thing and I'll, I'll stand by it. I think this entire forward-facing sonar situation we have within the tournament organizations is motivated by money. If, you know, if I went to Bassmaster, if I went to, you know, MLF and I said, you know, guys, I'm going to give you $5 million a year and intuitive angling is going to sponsor the circuit that all the guys have to have 2D sonar in the boat and that's it. You can bet there'd be 2D sonar in every boat and nothing else the next year. That's, that is the reality of it, Dave. You, do you deny that, that that would not happen? 
Well, I, I agree that $5 million will make a lot of things happen in, on Earth, Randy. You could yeah. even also walk down your street and offer to buy people's houses that had no, no idea to sell. But I, I'm going to tell you right now, I've done a lot of investigating inside of Bass. And dude, that's not where it's being. That's not where it's being. Like, but why would they? Why would they even say they're going to have a committee? If they if they were if they were literally just going to put blinders on, they would just put blinders on, and, and not even put any work into it. Not even spend the amount of time that they have spent with anglers and people talking about how this is affecting the sport. And again, I'm not picking a side. I'm just being open minded to the fact that. I mean, this initially started with us talking about people evolving, people embracing things like podcasts and YouTube. I mean, there's a bunch of TV shows that never evolve, that never embrace that. And those TV shows are in trouble now because they said, for years, I've been doing this and I don't need to change. Well, yeah, there's no doubt that you there, there's no doubt that forward facing sonar is incredible technology and you can't compete without it. In, in a perfect world, in my situation, that that technology would be reserved to like conservation departments to study bass movement and behavior and not be in the hand of recreational anglers in an ideal situation there. One of the things that I don't think a lot of people understand is it's not just the tournament anglers as far as the sustainability, but it's also the recreational anglers. And even if they're not eating the bass that they're catching about, catching out of it, when you start pulling these bass out of 30 and 40 feet of water and they have barrel trauma issues and they have delayed mortality and you got more and more people getting adept with that technology, eventually it is going to have an impact. And I, I did a video a couple months ago is there has been five different times that I've been at Tabor Rock this past year. I fish it, you know, once a week or so. And the couple of the different boat docks I've been down there, there's guys cleaning fish, crappie, bass, or whatever. And I talked to five different dudes out there cleaning limits of spotted bass that they caught live scoping. And they're talking about how easy they can catch spotted bass anytime they want to now, keeping them and catching them, playing it out, not just with bass, with other species. I got subscribers from Australia that tell me the Murray cod population is getting decimated because of it. I mean, at some point, it's going to start having an impact on our fisheries. And that's just one aspect of it that people should be concerned about, let alone the other stuff. But I just think that in, with Bass's decision on this, not to make any adjustments for the 2024 season in light of the fact that so many people have basically said, we don't want to watch it. We do not want to watch forward-facing sonar videos. I tune I tune out. I, Dave, I've got so many dang comments about people saying that they've canceled their Bassmaster membership. They're tired of watching live scope. And it just seems like that goes in one ear and out the other. And it's not, and it's not like I just see it from a handful of people. I see it over and over and over again. And I, I don't understand what is so difficult about saying, you know, let's just, let's just get rid of it. Let's go back to the way, let's just set a baseline. Like, like Major League Baseball does with bats or like with golf does with whatever. Let's set a baseline here and stay there and let these anglers showcase their, showcase their talents in traditional ways. I mean, what is wrong with that? I don't know what sport. I don't know anything. Technology never stops for anything. I mean, there, there's people who still want to use a phone book. <laughs> there's people, you, you know what I mean? Technology moves on and, and it, 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 it's just how it does in, in every single thing. Um, but the again, I don't think there's anything wrong with somebody wanting not to fish with it. I don't think there's anything wrong with somebody wanting to fish for it. I, I, I think fishing, I mean, some dudes like to tie a fly and, and fly fish. It's not my thing, but they like to do it. I don't judge them either. Okay. As, let's just say that you, you know, you were just an average dude that liked to watch Bassmaster television show. You didn't have anything to do with the sport. And you just love the bass fish and you look forward to seeing the Bassmaster television show once a week. Would you ever see Denny Brower flipping a half ounce jig into a flooded willow tree and boat flipping a five pounder? Or would you rather see some dude weenie worming out in open water? There he is. There he is. There he is. Oh, he's closer. Oh, he's got it. Which would you rather watch as a viewer? I think situations are situational. I think you're taking a person who doesn't fish anymore and painting a beautiful. It's like somebody saying, would you like to see Babe Ruth hit a home run? Or would you like to see somebody bunting 
with playing small ball to their way to the World Series. <laughs> okay, would you rather would you rather see Greg Hackney pitching a one ounce jig in the reeds at Lake Okeechobee with sixty five pound braid, you know, jerking a nine pounder, flipping in the boat, or some guy weenie worming for smallmouth in the middle of the lake where you can't see shore anywhere, staring at a screen? If you were a viewer, as it, I mean, I am a viewer. I work for Bass, but I'm a viewer. I mean, I'm a, you know how obsessed I am with the sport of fishing. I always have been. I think that visually there is much more appealing stuff that's happening with the Greg Hackney option. But I also feel like educationally, one of the most educational tournaments we had all year was Lake Champlain. When, you know, people like yourself, myself, magazines, everything have told people to fish that shoal because there's fish on the shoal. And they've turned their back to those fish that we didn't know existed before forward-facing sonar. And now we know how different it is and how little, how little time the fish actually spend on that show. The education part of it doesn't intrigue you. Yeah, but that it's, it's okay for those fish to remain out there undisturbed. Those fish for, for decades, ever since the start of professional bass fishing, there has been a large segment of the bass fishing the, of the bass population in any lake that has been protected from that. They were protected because they roamed out in those open schools and open water, and they didn't relate to any structure. They they were unmolested forever, and now there's nowhere for them to go. All those fish are molested all the time. And I, you know, I, you know, Aaron Martins and I were really good friends, and I, and I had a chance to spend a lot of time fishing offshore with Aaron on there. And he was able to pick that stuff up with 2D sonar, which required a tremendous amount of effort and work. And that's just sort of a different thing. But when you have technology out there that allows you to cover so much of that protected water that was before, leave no stone unturned. I just think if you look at the big picture down the road, you look 50 years from now, what is that going to do with our fisheries? You know, bass has been around since 1967. You put another 50 years, Dave, of technology, the way that it's progressing onto our sport, what do we have left? I mean, there'll be there'll be no mystery whatsoever. We'll know where every fish in the lake is at. We'll know the mood and personality of every fish. It's just, if, if people don't see that as a tragedy, I just don't, I don't understand how they can't wrap their mind around that. I really don't. Well, we're, again, I feel like um, I have to reiterate again that that I'm not. This isn't anti forward facing sonar versus pro forward facing sonar. To to me, um, I I, I want to find out how much it really is affecting it. I, I feel like a lot of the people that are upset about some of the smallmouth tournaments, they were upset about smallmouth tournaments when it was 2D. They were upset when when Coda was out on. In Buffalo winning, when Edwin Evers won in Buffalo, when they fished directly below the boat, they were like, this isn't bass fishing. So if you don't enjoy that kind of bass fishing, you're not going to enjoy it. But, I mean, if we're looking statistical numbers, the Elite Series ratings went up 11% this year. And, that, again, I'm not telling you that's because of forward facing stuff. I'm not saying that, but but everybody says the numbers are rocketing down. They went up 11% this year. Well, I, I don't know what the reasons for that was. I'm just telling you what I see from my from, from my viewers and my subscribers, the feedback that I'm getting from them on that. And and I, I'll get back to the point we're making here about I, I I don't think that people grasp how important it is to to have that unknown out there. Just like, you know, I'll probably never get to go to the Denali National Park in Alaska and see grizzly bears but just knowing that they're there is like super comforting for me satisfying for me it's the same with those fish it's like a Tabor rock lake out there when i'm when i'm throwing a mega bass jerk bait on a main lake point i can look behind me out there in 60 to 80 hundred foot of water and yeah i know there's fish out there good for them let them stay out there and roam around out there i don't need to mess with them i need to focus on these fish here and it sort of gets back to the Let's like let's use David Fritz for an example. Now, Fritz, for those of us that were around in Fritz's heyday, it was a sight to behold because David Fritz was so far ahead of the curve on offshore fishing that it's just he was in a completely different universe. Yeah. So his skills with the flasher and triangulation and being able to 
fish just hard structure and find little sweet spots in the middle of the lake through triangulation that nobody else could, that earned a tremendous amount of respect because I knew the commitment that it took and I knew the effort that that took. And people sort of looked at David Fritz in awe because he had this ability to do something that nobody else could out there. And that was great out there. But now it's like, when you take Fritz's time there, what he did with that versus what we have now, where every single person out there does the same thing, it it just, it takes away so much from it. I just, it's it's hard to explain. It's like, it's, it's like one of those things that some people can sort of grasp and not. It's, I use the example a lot of times of, you know, old, an old tree or something like that. You know, some people, a lot of people are outraged when a logger comes in and cuts down a 500 year old oak tree to make a coffee table. And then somebody else will say, well, you know, God, you laugh about it, how long, it, how long it took him to cut that thing down to make a coffee table out of it. So everybody has a different way that they look at it. And that's just the way that myself and a lot of my subscribers do. All right. All right. Let's move on from forward facing sonar, just because this is this show's literally turning into exactly what I didn't want it to be, which okay. is us against each other on forward facing sonar. Because here's my negative about forward facing sonar, and the last point I'll make. Okay. I think the average angler is tired of hearing about it. I think the average angler is tired of that argument. Dominant. I mean, I hear it in podcasts where people are just like, "Enough." I mean, yeah. and people can have their own opinions. And, and hey. Who knows what the future of forward-facing sonar is? I, I don't think it, It you know, for every bit of it saying it's doom and gloom, I heard the same thing about zebra mussels. I heard the same thing about gobies. Fish adapt. I think people give them a lot less credit than they deserve. But well, yeah, it's definitely the most polarizing issue in our sport. I think it's probably going to stay that way for a while, too. I think so. Yeah, I think so. And And, and I, again... If somebody dislikes it, this isn't me against you. This isn't me against forward-facing sonar. I'm just trying to look at it with an open mind and look at it. And, and I feel like at times you obsess over it. And 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 maybe maybe you will go down in history as the smartest dude, the only dude that got it right. And And I'll be the first one to put my hand out and say you were right all along. Because I don't think you're wrong in all your feelings. But I do feel like... This conversation started with me saying your channel's increasingly getting more negative. So I'll take it another direction. I did a little research and I never do research going into shows. I went back three years ago when you started posting stuff on, on YouTube and you made a video that talked about how to make it as a pro. And you talked about how much sacrifice you're going to have to make, but it's possible. You're going to have to do things that, that, Miss things like you talked at the beginning of this podcast, miss yep. proms, miss all sorts of different things. It had a much different tone than the response video that you made to Jacob Fouts, which said, and I wrote this down to make it in pro fishing, you have to spend all of your time fishing, thinking about fishing, working on fishing tackle, sacrificing everything you do, and you're going to lose everything your family, your wife. Your friends and family will be thrown by the wayside. This is the only way you will make it in pro angling. Mm -hmm. First of all, that's the truth about every pro sport. You do have to sacrifice everything, but you're literally telling a generation of anglers, if you do this, you're going to get divorced. You're not going to have a family. Do you not think that that is ridiculously negative? Well, I think it's real. I think, and I think one of the reasons my viewpoint on that changed a little bit is from my interaction that people have people the last couple of years that have started to try to do that as a profession. And I, the point of me putting a video out like that is I just want to let people know what they're getting into because it is everything that I said about that is true out there. Now, if you're willing to take that on and you're willing to make those sacrifices, yeah, maybe the sport's for you. But there's so many people out there that think they can do both. They think they can have everything, you know, fine at home. And they think they can be gone 150 days a year fishing and spending all this money. And it simply doesn't work out. I know I've been there. I've done it. I've got my buddies that have done it. I, I know so many people in this sport. It's not like I'm just saying this without having the experience to back it up. And um, I've just seen so many people that, uh, 
their lives have been really, really harmed financially, emotionally, finally, you know, with the relationships, that type of deal. And, uh, it's, it's really, it's just like I said, I mean, if you, if you're willing to put everything aside and focus and become tunnel visioned on it, then yeah, go for it. But other than that, if you've got, unless somebody is like financially independent and has a family that travels with them and they do that and they, they're willing to do that and they, they're truly behind the person, it is extremely difficult. And, I, and I'm just trying to educate people before they get into something that they wish they wouldn't have got into. Professional bass fishing is one of the most difficult ways to make a living that there is. Yeah. Again, unless somebody's financially independent. And the finance is obviously the biggest part of it, but then you get into the whole time, you know, time away from home, time away from your kids, you know, all the stressors that come with that. And don't get me wrong. It can be an extremely satisfying and rewarding sport that makes you feel alive. Like none others. I, I've been on both sides of it, man. I, yeah. I've been at the top of the game and felt those emotions. And I've been at the bottom of the barrel too, and everything in between, you know, for, for it. So, um, I just, I just, I just, I try to, I don't want to sugarcoat everything. People, I think people confuse me being negative with trying to be real, trying to give you guys an honest assessment of it. And, you know, so you can make your decisions based upon that. I, th I think to say that is an insult to all the great couples that are together, to all the people that, you, you know what I mean? Like there's been, it is. And I think every sport on earth, the difference is the payoff. Sure. Like if, if somebody hostages everything to make the NFL or anything like that, their the payoff is much larger. And, but the, there's also a physical issue that they end up with the rest. But I, I feel like anybody who does anything, anything, whether it be nothing to do with sports, if you want to be a stand up comic, if you want to be a stand-up comic, you are going to have to invest everything in it. You're going to have to do the amount of gigs. Like, that's why so many stand-up comics live in New York and why they all left California. Because there wasn't enough places to do comedy. Because if you want to become good at comedy, you need to do it five, ten times a night. Not once. You need to be obsessed with it. It's the only thing that matters. When you're not doing it, you're writing down stuff. But do we not spend our life celebrating people that make those those risks, you, you know oh, what I mean? That, that, that say, Hey, I'm not going to take the safe road. I'm going to do something unique. I'm, gonna no, chase I'm not saying thing. they can, because there, there are couples out there that it works great for them. I mean, look, look at, you know, Guido and Stella Hebden, Stella Hebden for years, uh, Stella Hebden, Hebden for years, you know, Brent Chapman and Bobby Chapman, his wife, there, there are couples out there that, that it works great for them. But I think that is an exception to the rule over there. I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at the overall, uh, situation that most people find themselves in. A lot of people do not have the luxury to, to travel with their significant other or their family. They have to work separate jobs and that puts a tremendous strain on there. That's just one aspect of it. And, and I'm the same way. It's like, I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to discourage somebody from following their dreams as a pro angler. Cause that's what I did, but you've got to realize the sacrifices it takes and it takes more sacrifice in 2023 than it did when I started in 1985. There's yeah. a lot of different reasons for that. So being a professional bass angler in 2023, it's, it's more difficult now than it's ever been because tournament performance is pretty much irrelevant. If you, if, as far as in terms of your value to the endemic or the non-endemic sponsorship side, if, if you are not involved with social media, it's very difficult to, to ride it out just on your performance. And that that's changed a lot over just the past five years. I don't know. I, I think social media is the new thing. But Randy, I mean, look at your own life. How many days did you spend on the road doing seminars? How many days did you spend corresponding with magazines? How many days did you spend corresponding with different TV shows, different radio shows? It's just that social media has replaced it all. Like my yeah. whole take on Fouts, and I've talked to him about it. Fouts is a great angler. But it, to go into this job feeling like one day I'm going to make the elite series and people are just going to bang down my door is naive to to you need to give more and more every single year. I mean, it's if you look at what a like you said, when you were in it, it was a lot 
easier because it was laid out. There was less competition, which is mm-hmm. the number one reason it was easier. But with yeah. competition becomes like if you could make a living from just fishing, why the hell is Gerald Swindle working so hard in social media? Why is Brandon Polnick working so hard in social media? Why are they documenting their lives on YouTube? Because they can catch them, and they've yeah. proven that. You need to do more than just fish. Yeah, I think I think most anglers today are, are getting you know very aware of that fact, and, yeah. and a lot of them are very resistant to it because the thing about social media – as an angler, it's like a, if you don't have the right personality for it, it's very difficult to immerse yourself in that. Not not just the right personality, but then having the technical skills to do it. So it's there's some people out there that it's just a lot more difficult than others. And a lot of people have a support system. I mean, there's some anglers out there that have, you know, families and wives that really sort of manage them. And mm-hmm. other guys are on their own. So it makes it, you know, everybody's situation is different out there with that. So it's it's it is it is more so much you know just even over the past 20 years it's like anymore there's it's almost like there's not anything there, there's not a pro anglers don't exist anymore they're basically influencers that just happen to fish that's sort of what we've turned into to a large degree with that especially since there's so many dang tournaments and so many dang circuits and options for that and nobody there's not a really a true cut definition of what a pro is anymore simply because everybody calls themselves pros and uh you're right competition is just it's it's made it a lot more difficult to stand out and will continue to do that i don't know any business you can get into nowadays and ignore social media like really i mean if you want to open a pizza shop you better be part of social media because a i mean it's your yellow pages it's your news i mean i don't know about you but the town i live in Literally in the last month, the newspaper stopped printing. They just, it, you know, nobody reads it anymore. Times are changing. You need to be part of social media. You need to, and trust me, I love it. The thing I hated about the Fouch show that I did, I loved it, but I also, I think people need to take onus on themselves. I mean, there's some accountability. You, you, you know, that's literally in the TV business. That's like literally or in the YouTube business, that's like making a video, putting it on YouTube. And if you don't get traction saying, well, I tried, they said, put it on YouTube. I mean, the, you of all people know that you have to continuously evolve and work to be where yeah. you are at. Um, and I do agree with you that that tournaments have become, I, I would not say that it doesn't matter. I think it, it does matter. I think it drives 90% of the innovation in our sport. I think it drives um, many, many things. But I think that you'd be a fool to say that they haven't diminished in value. I mean, at one point there was, you know, eight tournaments a year and that's it. And mm-hmm. and everybody's eyeballs were on those. So part of those, it does get diminishing. You know, the more live that's out there, the more leagues that are out there, the more people. So it, it's a very tough time for them to make it. Um, and, and that's why I have so much respect for all of those guys that do make it. I do. I mean, and that's the thing about it. It's like, I don't care. It, I don't care if you're a live scoper or if you don't like live scope or whatever. I have a tremendous amount of respect for people that just put themselves in the ring. I mean, just yeah. like when I was, you know, in my, uh, excuse me, in my, my, my martial art fighting days, it's like, even if somebody was not any good, you still have to respect the fact that they stepped into the ring. And it's the same with pro fishing out there. It's like, it, it takes a lot to do that, man. It takes a lot to extend you to extend yourself out there, just the logistics of the loan. And, uh, you know, yeah, I can disagree with a lot of people out there, but I got a respect for a lot of people that, you know, just even try it on any level out there. You had me at your martial arts fighting days. Tell me about that, Randy. Uh, well, that was back in my twenties. I, you know, competed for four years and, you know, martial art competitions back in my twenties. And I've sort of transformed that into jujitsu now, but um, I was 20, 23, 24, 25, 26, something like that. Wow. I didn't know that. I did not know that. You, you ever had to use those martial arts while on the water? No, <laughs> I haven't had to do that. Did you ever get close? No, I've never got close with that, but it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of similarities to that, you know, as far as the, you know, in competition with it because one of the things that's different or one of the similarities that i liked about fighting versus tournament fishing it's like when you 
when you get when you enter a competition, a fighting competition, you have to have a, a mental shift in your mind. And it's the same way when you put that throttle down the first morning of the tournament, you have this mental shift in your mind. And that's the coolest thing about it is because you you learn a lot about yourself as a person internally as far as, you know, how you can push yourself in both of them. And yeah. ultimately that's 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 the reason that I love tournament fishing and fighting both so much is because those are two things the only those are the two things i've done in my life that makes you feel alive more than anything else yeah and it's and that is what it's all about if you can do something that makes you feel alive it's like there's nothing better than that that's why they're so addictive that's why you know you know fighters and tournament fishermen out there they have a hard time giving it up because it's all it's this adrenaline rush it's this addiction that you have from that feeling that you don't want to let go of. Yeah. And, and I've, I've still got the same thing. If I spar in jujitsu, I get the same thing now. Or if I go, if I fish a Toyota series tournament, it's no different than I'm fishing the Bassmasters classic. You've got that adrenaline rush and that shift that comes with it. Yeah. I have an incredible amount of respect for anybody in combat sports. I think it makes some of the best, most well-rounded human beings. I, I think one of the bright shining stars of our sport, Brandon Polnick. One of the reasons he's as good as he is is because of his mental outlook on things, and uh, mm -hmm. because he was a state champion wrestler for several years. Uh, you know, and and the commitment that it takes to do weight cutting that they do on a weekly basis, and and just to put yourself in that arena, I think I agree with you totally. There, I think it's a huge. The, th the thing that I learned in the tournaments I fought in, it's like you, you can never underestimate your opponent. That is like no. the biggest mistake anyone could possibly make. I mean, I made it to the state finals in this one tournament, and the guy that I was up against in the finals, he was a lot smaller than I was. I mean, he was, I probably had 30 pounds on him and, you know, probably six inches. And he beat me bad in the finals. It's like I, I thought I was going to run all over this dude. And it's like, I learned after that, you can't ever judge anybody. You know, it's like that. I agree with you. Just look for, I mean, uh, I tell people this tip, check people's ears first. Look for the cauliflower ear. I mean, yeah. no matter how skinny that person is or how in, unintimidating they look, that it, it might not end well. Yep, that has a lot to do with it for sure. <laughs> Some guys, they, they don't mind getting beat on a little bit more than others out there. One of the topics that I wanted to talk to you about, um, because it shocked me, because you are such a proponent of the history of the sport. Do you really believe that Jordan Lee does not deserve a legend's exemption? When I did that post, I wasn't pointing out Jordan Lee on that. I was I was just pointing out uh, the But it was the day that it got announced or the day yeah. after. So it, without pointing it out, it's kind of... Well, my, okay, Dave. My my opinion on that is like I when when all the when all the Bass Elite Series pros went over to fish the Bass Pro Tour, I was shocked about that because Bass made their careers. I mean, all those dudes out there that were the poster children for Bass that went over to MLF, I just think they threw them underneath the bus. And when you make that type of decision and make that type of transition, I just think there's consequences for their actions. And I just do not think that. Anyone out there, whether it be Swindle, Polnick, you know, Jordan Lee, whatever, if they wanted to come back, I think they should have had to requalify just like Mike Iconelli did. He didn't take his exemption out there. I just think that made that comment. They made their bed. They need to lie in it. That's my opinion on that because I just, there were so many people out there that would have given anything for the opportunity to fish in the elite series and to throw that away just to chase some, you know, golden carrot somewhere. I just, I didn't have a lot of respect for that. And that's, I wasn't pointing out any individual. I'm just pointing out the whole format of how that happened with that. No, Jordan Lee is a, he's a freak in nature. He's arguably one of the greatest bass fishing talents in the history of the sport. I don't have anything bad to say about him at all. But didn't you do a similar thing in your career? Like, how can you say that when, when the, when the, when the original split happened long before the one that everybody talks about now, but the FLW bass split when the elite series started, did it you not was, do the same? Yeah, no, it wasn't the same at all. I got my elite series invitation in 2000 and 
2005, I think it was, or 2004. Yeah. And at the time, the, the the criteria, the bass set for the Elite Series qualifiers is that you had to run a Bush Beer sticker on your boat. Bush Beer was a major sponsor of bass at the time. And my title sponsor was Fuji Film. And, and in the FLW Fuji Film contract I had, we were not allowed to advertise alcohol or tobacco. And I could not afford to lose a six figure sponsorship to go to different organizations. I couldn't afford to fish. So in that situation, while I would have preferred to go with bass, um, I, I had to make that decision to stay with FLW. It was the worst decision of my life. You know, Jerry McKinnis and I were really close friends. Jerry was really, really mad at me about that for making that decision, really mad at me. And, um, but I was put in a position where I didn't have any choice to, choice to do that. So um, there's similar or not similar, you know, depending on how you want to look at that. Gotcha. How do you think the Legends deal should be changed? What What is your thoughts on that? If it's not directly against Jordan Lee, like who, because I, I mean, what do you think? What's wrong with it? I mean, it's pretty clear. You win a classic, you win Angler of the Year. You've got a chip, one well, for each of them. If if you win multiple ones, you have right. more. I, I know there's got, I mean, you've got to have some type of a system. I understand that. But I've always felt that, that and not this isn't to take anything away from classic winners because it's an incredible achievement. But to me, the Bassmaster Classic is the easiest tournament to win a Bassmaster. You've got the smaller field against the same people you fish against. Um, the only reason it is difficult, it only comes once a year. And I just wish there was a criteria for the legends that was more uh, diversified in the fact that maybe some type of accumulation of all-time winnings, classic qualifications, whatever. Uh, let's use Bernie Schultz as an example. I've used in one of my videos. Bernie, like I said, is, in my opinion, is like the epitome of a pro angler. He's everything a pro angler should be. I have a lot of respect for Bernie. He's never, you know, won a classic, but he's been there. He's made lots of classics. Um, you know, he's made lots of checks he's been in the trenches all the time it seems like to me that somebody like a bernie schultz not that he needs a legends exemption he's already in there but somebody along that category should be eligible for it versus just if you won the bassmaster classic you know and happen to put three good days together and then you can ride that the rest of your life and that, that i mean that's that's a legitimate debate for anybody to have as far as how those qualifications take place but um I don't know. Masters doesn't that. invite back the guy who finished 10th for 20 years in a row. They invite back the guy who won. Well, yeah, I, I understand that, but it just seems like that, you know, somebody can have one good tournament out of their whole career. And like I said, they benefit from that their entire lives where you got somebody else that may have had a decade spanning of this exemplary career that gets no notor no notoriety for it or no benefit whatsoever for it. I just, just to me, that doesn't seem like that's a, you know, a just system a little bit. Did you feel the same way last year when Larry Nixon got an exemption? As uh, well, Larry didn't come across from the, the, be at the Bass Pro Tour. Yeah. But I mean, a legends exemption is legends exemption. I mean, you, it, if you qualify well, for it, well, no, Larry, Larry fits in that category perfectly. I, I don't know, I have 20-some 20, 20 classic qualifications. I don't know how many wins, Angler of the Year win, classic win. Yeah, he's he's as legend as they come with that. And I'll never argue with that. But No, but my, my whole point in that, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't debating the legend's qualification to the point in that video. Mine was the fact of the people that were coming back with the legend's exemption from the Bass Pro Tour. I just, I just think that they should have had to stay over there or requalify on their own. And I, I don't, I don't th think a lot of people disagree with that. I mean, that's what's wrong with that. I mean, I remember when Ike and Ellie said, he goes, I just didn't feel comfortable about taking my exemption. I wanted to come back and qualify, you know, make it on my own. I mean, I got a lot of respect for that. Yeah. And I mean, every story has more sides to it. So, so we'll move on from that. Um, I think that they, uh, hey, I was, I was in the middle of it. It was one of the hardest things I've ever gone through that split. And there's part of me that, that hates every one of those guys for, for leaving. But there's also part of me that's a human. And I'm like, 
I've made bad mistakes in my life. I, I don't know at what point do you have to stop paying for those mistakes. But that being said, there's part of me that agrees with you. Go back to the opens and fish. But I just think the timing of your video, I mean, last year when we announced Larry Nixon, nobody said anything. Everybody just celebrated Larry Nixon coming back. But it, it that's the negativity I'm talking about. That If you ask your viewers who they thought that video was targeted at, if you do a poll, I can guarantee you they'll tell you Jordan Lee. Well, let me clarify that right off the bat. Jordan Lee is a freaking hammer. I've got a tremendous amount of respect for the guy. He won his classics before live scope. I think he's one of the greatest fishermen of all time. I don't have anything bad to say about Jordan Lee. All so. right. Good, good. good. Um, well, let's get away from these debating things and talk oh, about sure something. Fun. You can keep, we can keep debating. Yes, that's all right. I, I just can't handle the comments. It's going to be dirty this week. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it always is, man. It's just like, it's, you can't be all things to all people, man. You got, you, if, if if you got an opinion, you're going to get criticized for it. I don't care what it is. Yeah. And like I said on the Legends thing, I do agree with you to a certain extent that everybody, but I also don't, I don't know. I mean, you just got, you kind of, I mean, there, I'm torn on that one, but I, I just felt like it was weird how this year all of a sudden people were against it. And if you look at what Jordan Lee's done in his career, and I'm the world's biggest Larry Nixon fan. But in less than 10 years, Jordan's won two classics, qualified for four classics, qualified for five red crests, won it, won their heavy hitters, won angler of the year, won the, like, I mean, he's $2 million in winnings in less than 10 years. He's he, a hammer, man. He, he is a, incredible. He, he cannot deny that at all. So at the beginning <laughs> of this conversation, you, you said that you think so, in the past, people weren't allowed to be themselves weren't allowed to to be who they were did you feel did you ever feel like that early in your career that you were playing a part or have you always been the nonconformist that we see on youtube <laughs> well i had the opportunity it's like it's it's like you know Carl Jockamson and Brandon Polinick are sort of the poster children for Bass now. And back in the early 90s, well, and whoever, but back in the early 90s, myself and Joe Thomas were like yeah. poster children for Bass. And back then, you sort of had to toe the line a little bit. It's like if your hair was a little bit too long, somebody would say something to you. You know, if you weren't really dressed right, somebody would say something to you. You couldn't say anything really controversial with that. I think I told the story one time. Did you hear the story I told you about Randy Mosley at Megabucks, what Ray Scott said? No. We were we were at the Megabucks the Megabucks tournament in 19, I think 88 or 89. And uh anyway, Randy and I were roommates. You know, we traveled together for years and Randy made the top, he was leading the tournament going into the you know, the top 10 qualifications. So, you know, we had all of us up there on the top 10 stage. You know, and Ray Scott's going through and number one position, Randy Mosley, blah, 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 went down the line. And anyway, after everybody's walking off the stage, Randy and I are walking over there and Ray Scott pulls him aside and he goes, he goes, I do not want to see you come across the stage tomorrow with those Hawaiian shorts on. You go down to Walmart or Kmart and you get you some, you know, some respectable shorts. Do not come across my stage in those Hawaiian shorts. <laughs> Do you think that would happen today? <laughs> Ray Scott putting a hammer down on your on your dress attire. So that that's sort of the way we changed a little bit with that on it. Uh, yeah, I'd say we definitely changed it. And I mean, obviously, we're both huge fans of Ray. It was a different time. I mean, they had a lot of crazy rules. I mean, I saw you made a video a little while ago about the the rooming deal where, you know, if you weren't married, you weren't supposed to. And, yep. it, and if it. It seems strange in today's world, but it was also like, I remember Ray telling me we're in the business of building heroes and making, you know what I mean? So I think, mm -hmm. I think anything that seemed unprofessional to him and, and that's, that's generationally, there's things yeah. that you probably will feel are unprofessional that if you talk to your kids as they age, they'll be like, come on, what are you kidding me? Every, th this is just what we do. Um, well Go ahead. Oh, little story, Beth. You know the the infamous when I posed nude in the boat deal. I mean, everybody. That's knows what that was. My that. next question. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a little backstory. How what you're talking about on that is, you know, Ann Lewis, which I loved. Ann, she was the uh, communication uh, communications director for Bass, wasn't it? 
for those years? I think so, yeah. But anyway, uh, she set me up with this interview with that Details Magazine for that. And so we, you know, did everything with that. And they wanted to do the nude shot in the boat. So I went ahead and went for that. And of course, when it came out, it wasn't the backlit silhouette they said it was going to be. It was just... So how did that... Before we go forward, I I just have to ask, like, how do you go from being it like i've been in a lot of photo shoots and thank god nobody's ever asked me to get naked but how do you go like how do they convince a man to get naked on a bass boat well the writer traveled with us for six months writing this article and then wow. at the end of the six months they flew in a photographer from the magazine to do the photo shoot for the magazine article and they and we were doing some different shots and everything he goes i tell you what he goes the perfect shot for this is since you're nature boy and you talk about the environment and nature all the time since you're one with nature we need a shot of you in your boat with no clothes on because you're completely immersed in nature and i go we're going to do it it's going to be backlit they won't even be able to tell you it'll be backlit it'll just be look like some guy in the back picture there of course and then when it came out it was plain as day you know completely naked there not from the front from behind but anyway you know everybody flipped out. Ray flipped out. Nina Wood called me up and flipped out on it. I thought I was going to lose my ranger sponsorship. Bass hired a lieutenant colonel in the army that was an expert at, uh, at like putting out fires in the army. If like somebody, if an officer got in trouble. So they, they had me go to the meet with this guy, this army colonel to try to smooth this out. Like it was going to be like the worst thing that ever happened to Bass that I got a picture taken to me in my bare butt, you know, but I don't think you'd see that today. I think if that happened in 2023, it would be a big deal. Well, we, we've, we've got Matt Robertson who fishes in, fished in his underwear. So yeah. Um, what did Ray say? Like I could only imagine how, because Ray, God rest Ray's soul, but man, that he never, you never wondered how he felt about anything good bad or indifferent he let well, you know ray never said anything to me it was nina wood and uh and even guido hibden said something to me about it he was disappointed but nina wood you know force wood's wife ripped ripped into me because i nina was like she was like my mom or my grandma you know i've been to flipping a lot of times and i've been with ranger forever and it's like randy what were you thinking I am so disappointed in you. I cannot believe you did that. She was like, I felt like my mom was just reprimanding me on that. But uh, they How'd didn't you fire defend me. It? I, thought, I thought that I was going to be all done, but it sort of blew over a little bit with that. How did you defend it? Like when when your sponsor says, "Why? Well, how did you do this? Like what would... What was I, your excuse? <laughs> I just explained. I said they it was not supposed to be this. They said they were going to take this picture and they wouldn't eat. Nobody could even tell it was me. It's going to be backlit dark and it was going to be appropriate for the article, that type of stuff. So they were just that's sort of the 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 way it worked there. But it, anyway, it blew over. And um I think that's that one thing, I think that sort of maybe ushered in an era where people weren't as uptight about stuff like that. Cause it seemed like it, it got a little bit better after that within bass of it, anyway. Do you think that was maybe the biggest risk you've ever made in your career? Or is there other stuff I don't know about? <laughs> um, uh, let me see that. I, I didn't realize that that was going to be, you know, a risk at the time yeah. you know, much. I mean, most, most of the, uh, the most of the, uh, the outrage or the feedback negative that I've got in my career is my environmental stances. I mean, for what, and I've never really understood this. I, I've never really understood why hunters and fishermen are, they're conservationists, but they're not environmentalists. And there's a, a difference between the two. And I've never really understood why people were against protecting your playing field of the water and the woods. And uh, I'm obviously I'm very adamant about that, but that's probably the, the thing that has gotten me more, uh, more heat than anything yeah uh, i mean I, I think that angler so what's the difference between i'm environmentalist and a conservationist i mean if you look at world well, renowned like conservationists are the reason that anything's around like why are why are fisheries as good as they are not just because they were that way because because enough people cared about it enough people fished to put money towards making the thing 
And that's why when you go to places like Great Britain, they fish for chub and carp yeah. and some pike because that's all they have. Well, I think there's the difference between conservation and environmental issues is conservation is geared towards ensuring that they, they look at fish and animals as resources and they try to do stuff like increase habitat for the animals, you know, mess with creel limits and that type of stuff and bag limits. Environmental issues attack more stuff like point source pollution, you know, different entities out there that are responsible for polluting our air and water. So there's a little bit of a disconnect there. And then, and then for whatever reason, some people attach politics to environmental issues. With, it's not a political issue. It's a, you know, it's a human sustainability issue. And since I've been really vocal with that, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of feedback, negative feedback from some people that uh, I, I really don't understand what the deal is. Sort of goes back to me losing 500 subscribers in one day when I talked about climate change mitigation on Lake Mead. Uh, I don't care though. I mean, that's just, I, I tell you how it started, Dave. I, when I, when I was uh, in grade school, there was a little Creek at the bottom of my uh, mom and dad's house. And I'd go down there and wade that Creek and throw a little rapala in and catch little bass and perch. And I, this was my Creek. It's like, I, I picked trash up on it. I, I took care of it. It's like, I claim this Creek as my own. Cause I was there all the time. And I was fishing there under the bridge one day, and all of a sudden, some car that drove over the bridge threw a 50, one of those big contractor trash bags full of trash into the yeah. creek, and it, it broke everywhere, and trash is floating down my little creek everywhere. <clears throat> I would have probably, there's no telling what I'd have done to those guys if I could have gotten them that would have done that, but I was so outraged at, that somebody would do that to the environment of my little pristine creek but that it's something clicked in my mind. And I, I sort of become an environmental advocate at that point at like 10 years old, ever always have been. And well, I've I seen so much stuff like li little odd, real suspicious little pipes of stuff going into the lakes up the rivers that smelled nasty, like, chemicals being you know dumped into our rivers you know people trying to hide it that they were doing that lake you fall in alabama is full of it. if you run up the chattahoochee river there's all types of little little pipes that big around that are like pumping this nasty smelling stuff into the into the river just stuff like that yeah i mean i, I don't i don't know why anyone would be against somebody that's against that i mean we just look at our oceans and look at I mean, it, it's people can be gross. At I mean, I, I see it all the time. I mean, we had the Redfish Cup a little while ago in Georgetown, South Carolina, and they have this really cool piece of art that's right by the boat ramp, and it's made with um, wires, and it's kind of a fit. It's a fish. It's a redfish, but it's, you know, it's it's artistic, and it's welded together and everything. And as soon as I looked at it, I'm like, people suck, because there is a garbage can right there. But people have Mountain Dew bottles and all sorts of stuff like jammed in this. And you're just like, that's a gross well, part of the world. That, you'd be like, not, not there, but that not Georgetown, to be clear. It's not a gross part. I mean, I have lost thousands of YouTube subscribers over my environmental stances. I mean, without a doubt in there. And uh, it's just it's one of the biggest mysteries in life to me out there. It's really disappointing. So what do you say to people that say, because the common belief out there is your channel is you say the things you say just to get the traffic you get well I, my rebuttal to that is like anytime i say something controversial it costs me it costs me subscribers cost me view time cost me money so if, if somebody tries to twist it in i'm doing this to attract more attention to myself it's, it's hurting me more than it's helping me but that is I, that's more important to me. I mean, I, I've got priorities. I've got, I've got, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to squash my voice and my platform I have just to make a few more dollars every month. And, uh, you know, when I'm on my deathbed one day, you know, I can look back and say, I feel really good about what I did. I mean, if, you know, if I brought some light to environmental issues, if I, if, if I brought some light to sustainability issues, you know, I feel like I led a good life. And if I, if I would have like, you know, not said something just because I thought it was going to harm me making a little bit of money, I probably wouldn't feel that good on my deathbed, you know? 
Well, I think that's the truth with everybody. You you have to give back in whatever way you can. And and I mean, one of the coolest initiatives in fishing, and I, and I tell them this every time I see him, is Carter Andrews with his one piece a day. And it's as simple as literally he challenges his followers to pick up one piece a day, whether it's on the water, or off the water. I mean, it started with, I mean, he does a lot of saltwater fishing and you go on any of the Great Lakes or any of the oceans, you see how often there's balloons in the water because they, you know, they float out there and then the cooler air hits them and they, they end up in the water. But his, his initiative is as simple as that. Pick up one piece a day and post it on social media and he reposts it and you just see how many people... I mean, it's sad, but people need that reminder to pick up at least one piece a day. I mean, leave it's, it's one of the first things you learn when you get into fishing. Leave the place better than you found it. Um, well, one of the one of the areas that gets a lot that I get a lot of strife over is the fact that when you're when you're talking about protecting the environment and protecting our wild places and our lakes and our streams and our rivers for future generations, that pretty much can, it, 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 yeah, little individual acts like that make an impact, a little bit of an impact. But the main impact is through legislation and laws. And when you talk about legislation and laws, then you start to get into a political arena because a lot of times in politics, you have one side of the aisle that, you know, sides with big business and polluters and the other side sides, sides with environmental issues. So when you, when you've had that, that, uh, the lobbying efforts and the, politicalization of a certain thing like that you get attached a label to you and then if you're not on the right side of the label you get villainized with that and unfortunately that's sort of where we have came with that a little bit and until we can transcend that and uh, you know basically basically look at those laws the environmental laws that are protecting you know our ability to live and to be have a sustainable existence on this planet as that then we're never going to make any head roads. I mean, prime examples like Grand Lake in Oklahoma over there, there's there's chicken plants over there that have been pumping in crap into Grand Lake for years and they just get a slap on the wrist because they, you know, they they have such powerful lobbying groups and, you know, political allies that they don't get shut down with that. And in the meantime, you know, Grand Lake continues to get, you know, nutrient overload and all the problems you have from the fluent runoff. It's just stuff like that it goes on everywhere. Yeah, it, that, that nobody can argue with. I mean, you look at the stuff that's happened on Okeechobee, all it, I mean, and the saltwater, it's way worse, you know, when you look at how all of that stuff's been affected. So uh, I I think we, I agree with you on that stuff. At least we agree on that, right? Yeah. <laughs> what, yeah, uh, what, what is your, uh, what would you like? What would you, I heard somebody say it. It was the guy from Black Rifle Coffee said something really smart a little while ago. He said, "You're," and I've heard this multiple times, so I want to give him a shout out for it, Paul. But, but he reminded me of it. Your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. What would you mm -hmm. like people to say about your brand? Well, probably something about, yeah, I, I don't agree with everything he says, but I respect the fact that he gives his opinion, something like that. I think that's a pretty, I think that's a very good attitude for people to have about other people. I mean, I, I sort of, you know, that's sort of the way I look at it too with that. All right. That's, that's, that's a good thing to be. I mean, I think pe the, the belief that people will always agree is is foolish. It's just not how the, I mean, I enjoy talking to people that I don't always agree with. I mean, it's a very boring conversation if if you're just always agreeing. Well, I, I think a lot of it is, is, you know, as when we're little kids, everybody's, you know, your worldview is basically the worldview of your parents, what your parents yeah. is handed down to you. And then maybe your peer group a little bit with that. And it's very difficult to break away from that. Sometimes you may need to break away from that. Sometimes you don't. But one, one of the things that I think is important for everybody to do is like, like experience life on their own and make their decisions and make and create their own viewpoint of reality from their own experiences, not from what somebody tells them it should be. And the people that I have been around in my life that have, you know, sort of done that a little bit are usually the ones I get along the best with. Cause it's, uh, you know, it's, there's, there's, there's so much out there as far as that influences the way we think and, you know, in a good, a, a negative and a positive way, both. Let's, let's end this with, uh, 
give me one story about a kumite or what whatever karate fights are called. But what 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 is your most legendary karate story, Randy? Uh, my probably the one that stands out about the most anything. I was at this one tournament in Kansas City, and this and it was the semifinal round. And this dude that I went up against, the only thing he was trying to do was kick me in the nuts. It's like that's all the guy was trying to do. It's like I, I a lethal I finally, move. I finally round up beating him. I had a I had a uh, roundhouse to his. I got a roundhouse to his head and took him down with that. But I couldn't believe. It. I'm like, would you stop it? You know, it's like all this guy was trying to do is do a front kick into my nuts the entire fight, and it's just like it was pissing me off over and over again. That's probably the the, the main thing that I had there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean. Like, like kicking that, the nuts is a, like is a very effective move. Like that's the only move that he had. It's like I don't know if he if he advanced to the semifinals with that or whatever, but I couldn't believe it. So. A long line of angry people that he beat. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I've always said if I find myself in MMA, because uh, today's MMA, it seems like you can get away with one kick in the nuts and one poke in the eye. If you do it twice, they'll take a point. Yeah. So just go you, get too early. I tell you one of the things that I'm fascinated with, you know, I'm in, into jiu-jitsu right now. Yeah. And jiu-jitsu, I've, I've, I've read about it for a long time, but I only started practicing it a couple of years ago. And it is an unbelievable effective technique. It's like, if, if you're good at jiu-jitsu like that and, and, you know what you're doing. It's just like, it, it can stop a fight so quick. It's just like, it, it's so difficult too. I, I think a lot of people that watch MMA and they see, you know, people, you know, doing different type of jujitsu moves, they don't realize how complex it is. Yeah, It's an art form like none other. That's why it takes so long, you know, to get a, you know, higher belt ranks in jujitsu. But it's like, if, you know, if you can get a hold of somebody with it and, even a white belt in jiu-jitsu, it's like it's there's not another technique that's better for that. It's like physical chess. I mean, there's you know what I mean. When you get in one position, there's many counters, and it really is uh, it's pretty incredible. I mean, if you look at some of the people that have gotten involved in it, I mean, some of these supposed you know smartest people on earth, you know, Elon Musk and. Yeah. Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, Zuckerberg, I guess, broke his leg or something training. And they do you think they'll ever really fight? They say they're going to fight one day. I don't think they're going to. I think Zuckerberg would probably annihilate him. He's he's pretty much the real deal with that. You think but so? I, I think so. I Yeah, I think that Zuckerberg would annihilate Elon Musk. If the fight happens, I want to bet you $100 on it. I'm putting I'll, money I'll, on. I'll take that bet. On Musk. Just because, but, did you, you need to watch the podcast that rogan did with him a few months ago but he literally laughs at it he's like i'll beat him are you kidding me he said i'm i'm a giant compared to him i will destroy him as good as he is at jujitsu there's no way it's just like i i remember one thing one, one of the rounds we were sparring in i was sparring with the with the our black belt instructor at jujitsu and he let me get him in a rear naked chokehold which is one yeah. of the most deadly chokeholds in jujitsu so I get him in this rear naked chokehold and I was putting all the force that I could on this with, and, he, and he's about 20 pounds lighter than I was. He over a matter of about a minute, he flipped me over and got out of that rear naked chokehold and basically, you know, almost put me to sleep just like that. And so people don't realize the level of jujitsu that somebody like Zuckerberg has against somebody else. It, it doesn't matter how strong you are. It doesn't matter how many fights you've been in, how many bar fights. If, if you know how to manipulate somebody like he does, he, he would put Elon Musk to sleep in 30 seconds, probably. I don't know. I don't know. Elon Musk says that he, he's trained a lot. He's trained with uh, John uh, Donner, I think his name is. I mean, he used to train a, a world-renowned jiu-jitsu artist, and he used to train GSP, so... We'll see. I don't think it'll ever happen. I think it shows that the <laughs> world is so stupid that we take a couple of billionaires and they're going to fight. Like it's the dumbest thing ever. Really. Yeah. When you think about it, there there's the people that fight, fight. There's, there's a pride to, but they're generally from, they're fighting to make a living. They're fighting. <laughs> well, 
If I, I was a billionaire, the last thing I'd want to do is fight another billionaire. One thing I know from the fights I've been in is you you can you can pretty much predict how good somebody is by the attitude and how they hold themselves. And if you look at Zuckerberg's attitude versus Elon's attitude, Zuckerberg has the attitude of a real fighter out there, somebody that's got confidence in his skills. And I, it seems like Elon Musk is a little bit of a, a blowhard on that. I mean, but we'll, we'll see. I mean, I'll take you up on that bet, though, if it happens. Hundred dollars, hundred dollars. We will bet on two billionaires fighting, um, and it'll. I mean, hey, if it ever happens, maybe we'll do like a live stream. We'll do a companion cast. You know how they do during UFC, like Rogan will do it if he's not commentating. Where they'll actually do a live cast while it's happening, so people can watch it, and me and you can talk about it. <laughs> it's, <laughs> that would be good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we we can do that. Do you think a lot of people would if those two fought? Do you think? Do you think the world would stand? I mean, it has to. I mean, the two, not only are they two of the richest people, but two of the biggest platforms in all of social media oh. are, are there. Um, if if they had be. that event in Las Vegas and they promoted it, I think it would be the biggest sporting event, like in the history of, of sports, if they did it right. But it's so dumb. I, Is it a good thing? Like, does it make you feel good about Earth or bad about Earth? I like it. I, mean, I, I think it, I think it's pretty cool. I just, just you know, I, I've always um, the, the whole billionaire mindset has always fascinated me a little bit because I've I've had a chance. Well, I had a chance to uh, fish with uh, T Boone Pickens, who was uh, yeah. worth a couple billion. And those people out there, they fundamentally operate differently as far as how they interact with people. It's it's it's, it's a different vibe. It's hard to explain with that. But when the, a lot of those people, like I said, they talk they talk at you. They don't really talk with you. They don't have the ability to have a conversation. So I, that's why I would love to see those two going at it sort of puts them more of a human level there. Yeah. Yeah. It, it uh, well, we'll see if it ever happens. Um, and if it does, we have a hundred dollar bet on it. <laughs> um, and, and Hey, we may have alienated every one of our viewers because we may have argued for a while about <laughs> fish and stuff, but the moment when we started talking about Elon Musk and Zuckerberg <laughs> fighting, I'm sure a bunch of them were like, this is, I'm out. Yeah, they need to have Joe Rogan as commentator on that fight. That would be really good with that, too. Oh, he said he said he would love to do it. He said, I'm all in. Um, Zuckerberg, actually, Musk actually went as far as to say he would put Twitter, which he paid $40 billion for, he would put Twitter, I don't know if it was actually the exchange of the company, but it was like control of each other's company for a week following the fight. And he was like, yeah, I'll easily put that bet out there. So, um, Well, the interview I saw with him on Rogan, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, he said, you know, he weighs 240 pounds. He said, I would just lay on Zuckerberg and beat him. It's like, that's not going to happen. He's not just going to lay on him and beat him. So if, if that's his strategy, I think he's probably going to be hurting there. <laughs> Well, maybe <laughs> we'll see. We're both betting on things that we have no idea about. We have no idea. Um, but I, I always enjoy our conversation, but I, I have one bone to pick with you. I mean, you said all sorts of nice stuff at the beginning about this podcast and, and I thank you for that. And I thank all the viewers for allowing this podcast to be, but how the hell did we not make your top 10 list last year? We made your top 10 list of YouTube, something we did this past year. Did not allow me to make no, the list. That what did I do to piss you off? It's like I've got to change it around a little bit, Dave, for people to watch it because <laughs> you are you are forever in the top ten. But I've got to make it interesting so people just you know say, "Oh, this is, Randy just puts the same top ten every time on there." Nah, I know I'm only joking. But you're just... in a class yourself, so you know it's hard to even say with that. Well. I, I... I was, I'm totally just messing with you. I, I mean, understand. everybody wants to be on the Dave Mercer podcast. You, you do realize that, don't you? It's like, if you're on the Dave Mercer podcast, you sort of made it as a, as a pro in the sport. That's sort of what I look in there. See it on. Just like Zuckerberg and Musk fighting. I feel that says a lot of strange things about the world that if, uh, Hey, call me up if you want to be in the podcast. The thing I hate about podcasts is literally just reaching out to people to buy because I just always feel like I'm, you know what I mean? Like I'm, 
I know you're busy with stuff, but would you make an hour, an hour and a half out of your day to do this? So I hate asking people. So uh, if you want to be on, just let me know. Um, now I'm going to get all sorts of dudes. Sure, sure. Weird. If I say something that makes a bunch of people really mad at me, I'll call you up and we'll get on and talk about it a little bit. All right. All right. When's the last time you made people really mad that you think? Oh, I do every, as well, every live scope video I do. Every, I mean, if you look through my comments, I do daily, you know, it's like I can tell somebody that, you know, I really like a pro blue mega bass 110 jerk bait over a, another color. And people say, Randy, you don't know what you're talking about. That's the most stupid thing I've ever heard about it. You know, it's like, there's always going to be the critical ones out there with it for sure. How do every, you handle every, that? Like, do you, when you read stuff like that, do you, are you able to remove yourself from it or, or does it like when you read something and I get it, some stuff is just whatever, but does it bother you at all? Uh, I, I think the only thing that, that bothers me is like when, when somebody will make a, a, a comment that like, it's sort of like a vicious personal attack that, yeah. And it doesn't have anything to do with the uh, with the topic. I'll, I'll usually block those people out there. I, I just I don't really have any time for that. I mean, I don't have any problem with anyone disagreeing. I mean, I'm all about a civil, respectful debate. But there's a lot of people out there that they they're unable to debate an issue. They have to resort to attacking the messenger. And I I just think that that's, I don't have any patience for that out there. And and there's a lot of people out there that you know I. I they're sort of repeat offenders. They come on there every day just to like say something, try to make some type of smart ass comment. That's just what they do. That's just sort of the nature, nature of the, uh, of what I do with there. But unless I just want to, I mean, yeah, I could do videos about how to rig a Texas rig worm every day out there. And, you know, it'd be like a bread sandwich, you know, you know, YouTube channel, but at least I give some people something to, something to talk about or, you know, either a hero or a villain to look at, depending upon how you perceive me. But I can say one thing, all the, any dudes out there that hate me because my stance on the environment or forward facing sonar, I can guarantee you if we went fishing together for a day, we'd have a good time. Those issues would <clears throat> go, go by the wayside and uh, you know, we'd have a good time together. I can, I can confidently say that about anybody. Yeah. And I, I don't think anybody should hate anyone because their opinion, you know what I mean? Like if somebody, if somebody tells you this hat is purple and I say it's blue, I, I don't really, you know what I mean? If it's purple to you, it's purple to you. What, whatever. Like I, I just, I feel like too many people are searching for, it's funny to, to say this because we've argued about a lot of things today, but I feel like so many people are literally searching for an argument, for a battle, and and for somebody to bring up different points and things doesn't doesn't mean they're the adversary. They are, mm -hmm. they're. You may not agree with what they say, but they obviously care enough about what you care about to say it. I mean, it's like I told Fouts when we did the podcast. I don't know if you watched that one, but I told him like he kept saying, "I don't care, I don't care," and I literally stopped him. The only time I've ever stopped the guys and be like, "Stop it." Stop saying you don't care because you do. You care so much that you've put yourself out there and done this to try and get noticed because you care so much that you might just have to go get a regular job. That's So don't say you don't care because when people say I don't care, I think a lot of people, and especially the older generation here, is, that's like saying whatever. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's just a, an escape mechanism. You do yeah. care. Well, when you talk about, you know, handling criticism out there, it's like, an, you probably don't get it quite as much on your channel. Oh, yeah, you I do. Guys, well, okay, you probably do, but I, I've got people out there that I, I could, I could send out, I could put a message on my YouTube channel and say, guys, I need help right now. And that there would be dudes that would drive 2000 miles to help me. And then I've got guys like one dude said he was going to show up at the Toyota series tournament, Lake of the Ozarks and fight me. So I've got them on all ends of the spectrum. I said, well, come on, man. They never did show up, but uh, I've got them all, all, all ends like that. So you just sort of have to, when you're in the public eye a little bit out there, that's just sort of part of it. Of yeah. I, I, how I handle this, I just, I mean, and I don't get near as much as you. I, I'll admit that. Um, but I mean, I, you have some of the most start supporters too. I mean, there's people that, like if you say it, it's law. I mean, I, I there's videos you make 
and I see people commenting stuff on a video that I make that has nothing to do with the topic that you talked about, but somehow they wind it in there. So you have incredible supporters. But for the negative stuff, how I kind of justify it in my head is I remove myself from it. Like, Because if you don't like this podcast, that's okay. That, I, uh, this podcast isn't for anybody. If you don't, if you're not into what I talk about, whatever, that's okay. There's a podcast out there for you. You, mm. you know, and, and I kind of look at what the YouTube end of things or, or TV end of things, whatever, but I look at it like a product because if I was making tires, if I owned a tire company and I said, speaking of which, I need some tires for my truck. That's why I use that analogy. So shout out anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but if I owned a tire company and I made a video on my brand new tire and somebody said, those tires suck, I hate them. I wouldn't take offense to that. That's just their opinion. And, and I feel like that's where the, I think it's a really slippery slope in social media and not for adults. I think for kids, that's where it's gross. Like to me, it's, I mean, it's got to dement their mind. Like, cause it doesn't matter how popular a kid was in school. They didn't feel like they were the most popular in most situations. They didn't feel like, you know what I mean? It's tough growing up. And now they have a meter to judge it on, whether it's likes or whatever. And it's just, that's the gross side of social media. But for me, I, if you remove yourself from it and look at it as a product, it's not offensive anymore, you know, because because this very podcast, there'll be people that are like, why did you say that to Randy? Uh, trust me, there's going to be some people pissed that probably aren't even listening to this podcast anymore. They didn't last through the Elon Musk and Zach or Zuckerberg conversation, but it, it's just, it is what it is, right? It's, it's, it's part well, of the beast. I've never understood how somebody can get so emotionally invested that if I, if I say something negative about whatever, you know, that they would want to show up at a tournament to fight me physically because I made a comment that they didn't agree with. I don't, I don't understand the mentality behind that, but there's a lot of it out there, Dave. I'm telling you, I, I have got, if, if I could have, if you could read some of the comments that I have to delete that I get in there, there, there's some unstable, you know, people out there on this planet. There's a, ton of awesome ones too don't get me wrong there's a ton of great people out there i've made a lot of friends through youtube but there's some that you sort of got to watch out for yeah yeah that's the truth that is the truth there's a lot of crazy in the world and people now have a way to share it yeah that's in, true in the past everybody had a crazy dude who lived in their town like every town your yeah. town where you live right now my town there's a crazy dude you hmm. just but now that crazy dude has a voice um and some think that crazy dude might be you, Randy. And yeah. some think it might be me. Um, it's just the way the world has has gotten. It's uh, it, it's just. Uh, I hope nobody shows up at a tournament to fight you. If so, do you carry the karate headband? Can't like I said, I'm only envisioning you as Ralph Macchio. Well, this whole I'm time. all about jujitsu now. My karate days are over. It you can if. Uh, Anybody good at jujitsu will annihilate somebody that's good at karate. There's no, you know, not even any comparison to it. All right. All right. Well, I'm not going to argue with Unless they that. get lucky. I mean, everybody can get lucky with a kick or, or a punch. I mean, that's that's one outlier that always is, out, is always out there. Yeah. Yeah. Every fight starts on your feet. So it, if uh, you can get somebody on the ground, you're in trouble. And if you know what you're doing with jujitsu, it's just getting them on the ground, though. So can be the hard thing yeah well hopefully you don't have to do that and hopefully it's just a hobby no, of freak, yours i'm freaking 62 man i shouldn't be done on past that day sir so <laughs> hey there's some 62 year olds that kick ass and 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 maybe you're one of them um but dude i appreciate you doing this show um like i said at the beginning of the show I didn't know what direction to take this because most of our conversations, but I've seen like a bunch of videos in the last while where I'm like, what? Well, I just felt like there was an overly negative tone to them. And I don't think I'm the only one that said oh. that, but that could also be part of. I'll you know, I'll take note of that because my wife tells me the same thing all the time. It's like, man, you are getting a little too negative in your videos. You're going to have to increase the positivity on there. So Maybe I'll I'll heed that a little bit there. Well, Still be I'm, real, maybe heed that. 
I'm pretty sure your wife's telling you the truth. And, 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 you know, I mean, in a world where some people don't support you, I've never not supported you. I've, you know, but I just think that the world, I mean, it's important to spread a message. It's important to tell the truth very much so, but the world sure could use a little more positivity every once in a while, because oh, there's real yeah, problems, yeah. real problems in the world. And, and that don't involve, for facing sonar and some of this stuff and I, I let's not talk about that anymore the f word gets people wound up yes. <laughs> um thank you very much and uh we'll chat we'll, we'll we'll chat soon i'll see you for the fight oh i really appreciate having me on man that's thanks thanks a lot for that i appreciate it no problem that right there was a uh very unfiltered an uninhibited conversation with Randy Blockett. Um, there was some great moments in this conversation, and I can't wait to hear what you guys thought of it. Um, thanks for hanging in till the very end, too. You guys, if you're hearing this, you are a superstar. Thank you. I got to go. Bob Cobb, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like comment and subscribe because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?